It's our sacred mission to take an imperfect clump of biological matter such as you and transform it into something perfect. James has always had like a really soft spot for Rocket and wanting to sort of tell the story of the cruelty that happened to him as a little being, but also like how he was able to overcome so much to become, you know, the brilliant kick-ass guardian that he is today. This is about Rocket. So this is gonna be about Rocket making the choice to do what he's never done before which is go back for other people. He was always very honest about the fact that if we ever got to do a third installment, that it was going to be about Rocket. I knew that at the core of the story for me was where he came from and who he was. And it was very important for me to tell that whole story. And that was the main thing that kept me driven during the making of this movie was telling his story. And Rocket's the one I feel close to, so this is my story. I mean, Rocket is me in so many ways. Um, I think that, you know, the first story is the story of the mother. Take my hand, Peter. The second film is the story of the father. I have searched for you for so long. And this film is a story of the self, so it's innately more intimate because of that. We had people on set for both Rocket and Groot. My brother Sean played Rocket, and, and honestly, Sean was as important a member of the team as anybody else. In the first movie, it started with me getting a phone call from my brother James saying, hey, I need somebody that I trust to read these lines, but I don't know how it's going to work. We don't know what it's going to look like. And I just sort of showed up in London, and when we started rehearsing, it made sense for me to get in a very low crouch position and talk to the actors from there, because I knew that what the actors wanted was to look in, down and see eyes. Oh, we're getting out. And then we're headed straight to Yondu to retrieve your bounty. Sean's spirit really lives in Rocket. I mean, he, for years, has been doing this sort of unappreciated work of playing Rocket on set for all of us. And he's an incredible actor. There's ships just down that hall. We can get to one. I know. I can pilot it. And then we'll fly away together to Forbes. Just like we always said. Okay? Actors don't, you know, they aren't doing monologues. They're acting off of somebody else. I told you a million times you keep your grimy raccoon hands off my Zoom. I told you a million times, I'm not a damn raccoon. And that tennis match of acting, you need somebody else lobbying the ball back, and that's what Sean did. And then, you know, a lot of it was just the dynamics of how Rocket talked and who he was and this, this angry thing that's a part of who Rocket is and the sadness that's a part of who Rocket is. I mean, to me, that's what drives Rocket is. He's got this unrelenting loneliness and sadness. That's where his anger comes from. Ain't no thing like me, except me. Stitch him up and transfer him in with the rest of Batch 89. What audiences care about more than anything else are the, the characters that they fall in love with, you know? And, and so I wanted Rocket to look like a real animal. I mean, the idea of this is that they took a, an innocent little beast and turned him into something that could walk and talk and shoot a machine gun and make machines. And the little creature didn't necessarily want that. There's still a part of that little creature that is surprised that he's able to think in the way he is. You know, the comic books, sometimes Rocket gets a little too cartoony for me, and I didn't want that. I wanted him to look like a little animal that was manipulated and changed into this thing. It blew. That's the sky. Sky. Rocket. Yes, it is. The first movie, we spent a lot of time looking at raccoons. There's a, a raccoon by the name of Oreo who became my pal in London, and I'd hang out with him all the time. The visual effects artists would all study Oreo, and Oreo was the basis for a lot of what Rocket is, because if we you know, started cutting up Oreo and adding machine parts and putting in other brain elements to, to Oreo and turned him into a little creature that could shoot a machine gun, it would be a little bit like Rocket. The Krabby Puppy's so cute, he makes me wanna die! Rocket has been reformulated in such a way that he's not just a raccoon. His mouth has actually been, you know, grafted and mechanically altered so that he can speak, you know, words like us. And so there are elements, actually, of my old dog's mouth in Rocket because a dog's mouth 
is not great at speaking, but it's better at speaking than a raccoon's mouth is. So we took a lot of uh, shots of my dog, Von Spears' mouth. Oh, yeah. We had a lot of voice actors audition for the role of Rocket, and they sounded like cartoon characters. We had a lot of dramatic actors come in and audition for a Rocket, and they weren't funny. We had a lot of comedians come in, and they didn't seem to have the heart and grounding that the character needed. And Bradley is somebody who is able to create a character, he's able to, to fulfill the dramatic needs of a character, he's able to fulfill the comedic needs of a character. Who is that maniac? Some super douche with ray gun hands! One of our first conversations, I remember, he said, so, like, do you want me to use my voice, or do you want me to create a character? And I'm like, no, don't use your voice. This is a character. It has to be totally separate from you. I live for the simple things, like how much this is going to hurt. And he's been, you know, incredibly invested throughout this process. We watched the performance that Sean did with, you know, whatever actor it is. And then, to be honest, most of the scenes he acts with me. Do you want to do it where you and I do it? I always feel it's better. You got it. I end up at playing the other characters in the scene. He ends up being Rocket, and we act it in that way. And that seems to keep it more alive. It keeps more of the ping-pongy, real feeling of acting. Yeah, this could be futile, Quill. I'm telling you, he's too powerful. Well, then I guess we're going to die trying. Uh, what is dying trying going to accomplish? Or we could just give him the badger. Now, our thing is dying trying. Well, it was a long haul for Bradley. We did many, many days. And some days we would do a whole bunch of scenes and I would come in and decide I wanted them different. And we would go back and we would do it again. And Bradley really went with it. I mean, he was able to adjust to all sorts of stuff. They made us for nothing. Little, little monsters. Little... Stupid experiments to be thrown away. He brings some real magic. He breathes not just his voice, but his heart into the character, and you can really feel that. My beloved raccoon, this story has been yours all along. You just didn't know it. I'm not a raccoon. It means a lot to me that people respond so well to Rocket, and that Rocket is like such an amazing character in cinema history, I think. Rocket, we love you very much and we're happy you're alive. Well, that makes you the idiot, Sid. I always feel like I'm a slice of that. Like there's a whole bunch of people who came together to do this. From Bradley Cooper, who does like this unbelievable job voicing the character, to my brother James, who writes the character and I'm trying to translate what he's thinking about. And then the whole special effects team, which is in the middle, and they're trying to get him to the place where he's 100% real on screen. I'm done running. I've felt grateful to be a part of it and proud of the work that we all have done in creating this character. I was watching some of the, the you know, visual effects that we were putting in the other day uh, for this, this movie. And it's just this gigantic sequence on counter Earth with this biggest spaceship ever rising up from the ocean and huge everything, explosions, people dying, all this stuff. And I said, this is the biggest movie ever made about a raccoon accepting the fact that he's a raccoon, which is really what the heart of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is uh, at, at, at its core. It's about Rocket accepting who he is and coming to love himself and who he is is a raccoon. How dare you think you are more? Eight, nine, P, one, three! Uh. The name's Rocket. Rocket Raccoon.